What? The Fibonacci sequence is a number pattern where each number in the sequence is the sum of the previous two. Placing the phone on the table between us, Professor Forster points to the topmost line of numbers. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, and so on. 0 plus 1 equals 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2. 1 plus 2 equals 3. And 2 plus 3 equals 5. You can see as you add the previous two numbers, this gives you the next number in the sequence. She points further along the line. 55 plus 89 equals 144 and so on. She looks up at me, her eyes shining with excitement. This is not some random list of numbers, Jamie. We see the Fibonacci sequence all around us in the universe. The number of petals on a flower follows this pattern, as do the way that branches grow on a tree. Generations of honeybees in a hive, the patterns in a pine cone, even the proportions of the human body match the Fibonacci numbers in a strange and fascinating way. Professor Forster grabs hold of a pen and starts to draw a series of connecting squares on the paper in front of her, each one growing larger than the last. I can even show this pattern visually. If I see the Fibonacci numbers, if I use the Fibonacci numbers for the dimensions of these squares, I can then draw a line that joins them together. She uses her pen to trace the line from the centre of the page and as I watch this curving line spiral around, connecting the corners of each square in turn, the picture fits with a click in my mind. This is called the Fibonacci spiral, Professor Forster explains, and this precise form can be found in shapes of seashells, hurricanes, even spiral galaxies. As she lifts her pen from the page, the astronomer stares down at the spiral she has just drawn. With a flicker of recognition, she starts to reach for my mobile, but I've already snatched up the phone from the table, swiping back from the calculator app to reveal the golden spiral on my screen. My eyes flick between this and Professor Forster's drawing. The two spirals are exactly the same. Do you know what this means? Professor Forster breathes. Many scientists believe that if an alien civilization wanted to communicate with us, they would choose a universal language that we share. Whatever planet we live on, we can all look up at the sky and count the stars. One plus one equals two everywhere. Maths might be the language that aliens use to talk to us. Sending this Fibonacci sequence could be their way of letting us know that the signal has been sent by an intelligent species. You mean you believe me? I ask, unable to tear my eye from the golden glow of the Fibonacci spiral on my phone. You really think that buzz is real? I'm not saying that you've spoken to an alien, Professor Forster replies, holding up a cautionary hand. The vast distances between Earth and even the nearest stars outside of the solar system mean that any kind of instant communication would be impossible. We can't have a cosy chat with E.T. on the phone if he's 50 light years away. But if this signal is of extraterrestrial origin, the implications for the human race are profound. This would be the first proof that we are not alone in the universe. So what do we do? I ask, barely able to hide my excitement. Professor Forster holds out her hand for my phone. We bust open your mobile and take a look inside. If this signal has been downloaded onto your SD card, I need to investigate this. I jump in surprise as the phone begins to vibrate in my hand. Glancing down, I expect to see a spiral spinning in time with this insistent buzzing sound, but the golden icon is still frozen, stuck motionless on the screen. Instead, I see a new text message, text message notification, a painful reminder that aliens aren't my only problem. Where are you? Mum, kiss. It's time for me to go now. When I get back, Mum's waiting for me at the kitchen table. Where did you disappear to? She asks the sharp tone in her voice telling me I'm in trouble. I've been worried sick. I sent you a text half an hour ago, but it didn't get any reply. What's the point of you having a phone if I can't get hold of you? I don't say anything, but just push my mobile deeper down into my pocket, out of sight. Professor Forster wanted to keep hold of it to find out more about Buzz, but I just did a runner from the observatory before she could take it off me. It's my phone. I walk straight past Mum, heading for the fridge to see if there's anything left to eat. Jamie! 
Mum says, sharpening the sound of my name so it ends with an exclamation mark. I'm talking to you. But you're not, I snap, turning around to face her at last. Not about the things that really matter. Like the fact you and Dad are splitting up? Mum looked shocked, her hand rising to her face almost like a shield. You heard us talking on the video call, she says, her voice suddenly drained of volume, so I have to strain to catch the words. A about the divorce? I nod my head, trying to fight back my tears. Oh, Jamie, Mum says, getting up from her chair and reaching out to give me a hug. I didn't want you to find out this way. Your dad and I wanted to tell you together. I don't want a hug. I just want answers. What does it matter how I found out? I explode. You're still getting divorced. Jamie, don't shout, Mum says, trying to keep her voice calm. Your granddad's upstairs giving Charlie a bath. I don't want you upsetting your sister. I think about my little sister and how she's going to feel when she finds out the truth about Mum and Dad. A horrible thought creeps into my head. What's going to happen to us? I ask wiping my eyes with the edge of my sleeve. Who are Charlie and me going to live with? Well, these things are all still to be properly decided, Mum says, but your dad and I think it makes sense for you and Charlie to stay here with me at Grandad's. I feel like I have been punched in the stomach. But Dad's coming home next week, I protest. Where's he going to stay? Your dad's going to have to, ha have to follow an intensive rehabilitation programme to get him used to life back here on Earth. Mum explains. For the first month, he'll be living in special quarters on the Air Force Base. It's just a half an hour's drive from here. I think about all the different Air Force bases we've lived on as a family, never staying in one place long enough for me to make real friends. Dad's training trips are taking him halfway around the world for weeks at a time. As I try to make sense of what's happening to us, all I can see in my head are pictures of Dad saying goodbye. It was my job to keep an eye on the Drake family solar system and make sure everything kept spinning safely until Dad got home. What did I miss? Your dad still loves you, Jamie, Mum tells me, taking hold of my hands in her own. I can feel her fingers trembling next to mine, her empty words hanging in the air between us. We both do. You know that, don't you? I shake my head, tears stinging in my eyes. I don't care. I say, snatching my hands away. I just wanted you to tell me the truth. Slamming the door behind me, I race upstairs two at a time. I need to get inside my room before I start falling apart. On the home screen of my phone, the golden spiral is still frozen, mid-spin, and I'm starting to wonder if Buzz will ever speak again. I've got so many questions racing around my head, but the one I really want to know the answer to is one it's impossible to ask. The only question that might explain why my family is falling apart. I can barely even whisper this to myself as I sit here alone in the darkness of my room. Why doesn't Dad love us anymore? As if in answer to my question, the phone suddenly vibrates. Who is Dad? I stare at the screen in total astonishment. The golden spiral is spinning again as a metallic voice echoes from the speaker. Professor Forster said this was impossible. Buzz is back and it's talking to me. I shake my head, trying to make sense of how this can be happening as my thoughts tumble and whirl. Who is Dad? Buzz repeats again, the robotic voice sounding softer, almost human now. I take a deep breath. If this really is an alien civilization on the other, si other end of the line, I've got to make sure I give the right answer. The fate of the human race could depend on what I say. It could mean the difference between invasion and an invitation to join the Galactic Federation. With a trembling finger, I tap on the phone screen to bring my camera, then flicking through the gallery of pictures until I find the one I'm looking for. This is my family, I tell Buzz. Mum and Dad, Charlie and me. In the picture, Dad is standing with one arm around Mum, smiles beaming from both their faces, as a fairy tale castle sparkles with the light behind them. I'm holding Dad's other hand looking up at the camera with a huge grin as Mum cradles baby Charlotte in her arms. This photo was taken at Disney World in Florida on Dad's day off from the training on the Lightswarm launch simulator at the Kennedy Space Center. It's my favorite picture of us all together. 
Without me touching it, the photo suddenly zooms until Dad's face fills the screen. I can see every detail of his smile, his sunny features unlined with worry. He looks so happy, just like the rest of us. I search for his eyes for any trace of doubt, looking for a sign that could explain what's gone wrong, but I can't see a thing. Where is your dad? Buzz asks. Outside my bedroom window, the sky is ink black, with a blanket of stars scattered across it. I hold the phone up to the window. He's up there, I say sadly, scanning the sky for any sign of the International Space Station. For a second, the low hum of the phone's vibration seems to quiet, quieten, as if Buzz is looking out, for some, out from the camera lens. Then I hear the soft tone of its voice again. That is where we come from, too. As I hold the phone up, I see a new picture on the screen, pale pinpricks of light st studding the sky above Beacon Hill. I recognise the shapes of the different constellations Dad showed me when we were stargazing on nights like this. Pisces and Pegasus, Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle, with a bright star of Altair shining from its head. When Dad first taught me how to look at the stars, I could never quite see the shapes of the animals and people that gave the constellations their name. We spent hours tracing the shapes in the sky, while Dad told me crazy stories about Greek myths and gods. But now as I look at the archer with his bow drawn low over the horizon, these shapes Dad showed me are all I can see. From the stars. As I stare at my mobile, the shapes of these constellations suddenly shatter into pieces. I watch amazed as the stars begin racing towards the screen pinpricks of pure white light erupting into brilliant blue flares and then fading to a red glow at the edge of the screen again and again and again. It's like some out-of-control spaceship is taking me on a tour of the galaxy, travelling at the speed of light. I see clouds of dust and gas scattering into spirals and swirls as the emptiness of space surrounds me. We've travelled so very far. In the centre of the screen, I see a single pinprick of light grow larger before splitting into twin stars. These bright white sparks transformed into fiery spheres. In the shadow of the larger star, I see the shape of a planet in orbit, a blue-green world that looks almost like Earth.